Thank you, Zach. Thank you very much. Zach is, uh, leads worship with our student ministry and also with the uh, Synergy Wesley Band. And so thank you, Zach, for blessing us today. Um, do you have a family like mine where uh, there's family stories that get told and retold and retold again until everyone's kind of tired of them, but you can't help yourself. You always tell them over and over every time you have a family gathering. Is that just us? Here's one. My brother was three years old. Uh, turning three that day was his birthday. My mom had baked uh, him a strawberry cake, which is like the uh, traditional birthday dessert in the Gilliland household. And it was sitting there on the counter with its fresh out of the oven and that pastel pink icing, you know, freshly glazed. Oh, it just was looking beautiful. So beautiful, in fact, that my uh, three-year-old brother at the time was standing on a chair looking intently at it. And my mom sees this in the kitchen and she goes, Jake, we are eating that for dessert later after the party. Do not touch that cake. And Jake looks over at her kind of with the, the look, right? And he looks back at the cake. He says, I'm not going to touch it. And he leans in closer. I'm not going to touch it. And he leans in closer. I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to lick it, yeah, and just all the way up the side of the strawberry cake. Waiting is hard to do. We are not naturally a people of great patience. Some maybe are, the few saints among us, but most of us staring at the strawberry cake are not going to touch it, but we are going to lick it, right? Waiting is hard. It can be hard for trivial things like strawberry cakes. Maybe uh, the more impulsive side of you got the better of you this past Black Friday. You hit the buy now option on Amazon one too many times. Waiting can be especially hard when it's things that are far less trivial. Maybe those deepest desires of your heart. And the answer you routinely receive is no or not yet. Waiting can be painful. Waiting can be frustrating. Waiting can be worthy of lament, that, that classic scriptural refrain of how long, O oh Lord. Have you ever felt that kind of waiting in your life before? Or have you carried that into this moment of worship now? That's the kind of waiting that is woven throughout the song we just heard, O come, O come, Emmanuel. It's an Advent song. doesn't sound very Christmassy, does it? Santa Claus is not coming to town in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We, we've cut Advent out of our sort of cultural experience. Maybe you don't even know what that word means. Advent is the liturgical season that we observe in the Christian calendar and in the Methodist church. It's that four weeks that precedes Christmas, four weeks of, of waiting for the Christ child to join us, for God's presence on earth to be born. And Advent songs are not Christmas songs. Advent songs are born of waiting. Frequently, they are born of pain, like we heard in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel, who mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. But did you hear it? Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, God is with us, ransom captive Israel. Waiting is hard, it's hardest in the moment, and perhaps it's best for us to look to our ancestors to understand the fruit that we can find in faithful waiting. So, we're starting this new worship series for Advent called the Songs of Advent, where we'll look at a different song each week. And this week, we're looking at the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And the text that we'll look at with it comes to us from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is going to be an ancestral help for us today. If you don't know anything about the book of Jeremiah, here's the quick hits. Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. He's one of the major prophets, one of the big ones. Good job, Jeremiah. You made it. Jeremiah was a priest in the southern kingdom of Judah, a person of 
a pretty considerable privilege, who felt called into a prophetic ministry. And I'll say more about what it means to be a prophet later on. But the point is this, uh, Jeremiah l- l- sort of uh, delivers these prophetic sermons, these challenging, convicting sermons to the people of Israel to help them understand something really important that was happening in their lives, the exile into Babylon. Remember the story of, of Daniel in the lion's den? Remember Daniel from the Bible, maybe, perhaps? Well, that's the Babylonian exile. Jer- Jeremiah helps explain how they ended up in that situation. King Nebuchadnezzar comes and and attacks Jerusalem twice over the course of a decade, and the second time it's extremely successful, and the people of Israel are exiled, taken away. That was the Babylonian habit of assimilating their conquered peoples into their society and culture. Jeremiah is trying to help the people of Israel understand how this could happen, because when you're the people of God, and you believe that your God is the cosmic God, the universal God, the God of all power and might, and then another king comes to conquer your land. What gives? How did this happen? So Jeremiah's sermons could be broken up into sort of three major pieces. The first portion of the book of Jeremiah deals almost exclusively with convicting and calling out the people of Israel. He's going to point their, intention, their attention not to some scapegoat, not to the king of Babylon as the reason why they fell. No, it's not because their army was bigger than yours. It's because there are some deep-seated sins at the heart of our society that we have to deal with. That is why the foundation crumbled. Namely, we began to worship other gods, Jeremiah said. And as a result, we've stopped caring for the poor and the widow and the orphan. And then there's the third portion of of the book of Jeremiah that deals with the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah says, Babylon, you're not off the hook. God's justice and righteousness will reign upon you as well. Your empire will fall as every empire does. But then there's this middle portion. It's just a few chapters long, but oh my goodness, the whole book hangs upon these words. And that's where we're going to find ourselves today. It's words of vision about what could be what's possible, what God is doing, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in the future, what God is working towards for the people of God. That's where we find Jeremiah's words in chapter 33, beginning in verse 14, where he says this, "'The days are surely coming,' says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. We'll keep reading in a little while. In our text today, and when I consider who Jeremiah was as a person and as a prophet, there are two qualities that I think are worthy for us to investigate, to internalize and emulate in our lives. The first is patience. Jeremiah is an incredibly patient person. And I struggle to hear that because I'm not a necessarily patient person all the time in my life. And yet, how frequently does Scripture call me to be something more than what I already am? Jeremiah, the person, was incredibly patient. If you don't know much about his life, Jeremiah's life was kind of like the Apostle Paul, if that's a more helpful reference uh, from the New Testament. Jeremiah was a prophet, right? So he, he brought hard news to the people of his culture and society. He walked into the middle of the town and basically said, here's all the ways that we're failing. And I don't know if you know this, but that doesn't make you popular doesn't get you invited to a lot of dinner parties. Jeremiah ended up abused physically and verbally. He ended up imprisoned, literally lowered into a cistern at one point, like solitary confinement for an undetermined amount of time. Jeremiah's life is not one that was going to end with sort of the rainbows and sunshine happy ending. The people of Israel were still in exile when his life was over, and they would be for generations. Jeremiah had to do a lot of waiting, painful waiting. 
And yet there's this deep-seated patience, and it's woven throughout who he was and the way that he preached to the people in his land. And I think it was born out of a theology that we ought to notice. There's a theology of patience that Jeremiah possesses. And what it looks like to me is this, is that Jeremiah understood God to be somebody who, who was more than simply providential. Now, a God of providence, a God who provides, providence provides, that's a good thing for us to acknowledge in God. Bring us today our daily bread, right? That's part of the Lord's prayer. Give us today our daily bread. The, the God that provides the, the necessities of daily life. Okay, good. But sometimes we can take that concept of providence and expand it to mean the God who gives me everything I ask for. Or the God who gives people who are good, good things. And the people who are bad, bad things. And the problem with a theology that, that leans in that direction is that it's not borne out to be true in the real world. Do you hear me? I don't know if this is just me, but in my life, just because you do good doesn't mean you get good. <laughs> just because you do bad doesn't mean you get bad. Just because I go to God in prayer and say, please, 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 doesn't mean that I get everything I ask for. God's not Santa Claus in that regard. To believe in a God who is more than simply providential, Jeremiah points to a God that is redemptive. A redemptive God is something different than simply a God of, of personal providence. Whatever I want, I receive. A redemptive God is a God who can look at you in the cistern, in the deep and dark and lonely place, and say, even here, goodness can come forth. Maybe the story won't be a happy ending, but goodness can come forth. Purpose and meaning can come out of this dark and lonely place. Jeremiah needed God to be more than simply personal providence, but a God of redemption who could look at exile being led away or look at Israel being led away in chains of exile to say, one day, in those days and at that time, you will be restored. There will be security. There will be safety. There will be liberation. There will be salvation. A redemptive God is not someone who just meets all of my personal whims and desires, but says, even when life goes off the rails, even when everything feels broken and lost, even when it's my darkest day and I can't imagine life being any worse, even there, even in those places, God is at work and is alive. That is such a more meaningful picture of a God than a God of personal providence. At least it is for me. Is that for you? If so, say amen. And so, my friends, perhaps we're not called to wait for our heart's precise desire. Advent is not a season of waiting to see what falls down the chimney on December 25th. Advent is a season of instead joining in God's work in those unexpected ways, those unexpected people, those unexpected places. That's what it means to wait upon a redemptive God. Jeremiah calls all of the people around him into this kind of redemptive hope when he points to the branch of David, David being the, the heralded king of the nation of Israel, the, the first king, the one that they celebrated and, and made a legend of and even mythologized in many ways. And, and Jeremiah says, one day that branch will sprout again. And of course, if you're familiar with the Gospels, you know that people had a certain image in their minds. They had a personal providence idea of what the branch of David would look like. It'd be a great and shining king in armor, and instead they're given this weak and poopy baby. I mean, seriously, they're given this thing that, that needs a mother and a father and is living in a manger and grows up to be this sort of hippy-dippy rebel type that's preaching like, I don't know, socialism? What's wrong with this guy? That's the branch of David. It's redemptive. It's surprising. It doesn't simply give us whatever we want, but invites us into something more meaningful than our heart's personal desire. The hope of Christ is a hope that patiently waits and works with a God of unexpected redemption. And that word hope, today is the, the day of hope in Advent. That word hope is so important because without hope, waiting frequently can turn into despair. Have you ever felt despair? I have. It's not a fun feeling. Despair is when you're waiting, but you don't see any light. You don't see any possibility. You don't see any future. You're just waiting for what? 
That's why Jeremiah points us to a hope that is bigger than our present circumstance, that's bigger than our present moment, that's bigger than our lives, my life, your life, anything happening in this room or online today. The hope that Jeremiah is preaching about is rooted in something so much bigger because Jeremiah knows that without hope we fall into despair, but with hope we can move from despair to patience patiently waiting, patiently working, trusting that we're moving towards something redemptive and good and holy and of God. But where does that hope come from? Well, we'll have to keep reading. Because in addition to being patient, Jeremiah is also a prophet. Remember, I said I was going to talk about what prophets do. See, prophets were these Old Testament figures who were called not just to call out the nations in which they live. That's a primary purpose of a prophet. The prophet would point out those moral failings, those, those societal sins that were leading to the crumbling foundation of their culture and society. That was a primary role of the prophet. But the prophet did not simply point out that, that hard news, that convicting news, that challenging news to the kings and to the people and the lands in which they lived. The prophet also importantly had to offer a vision of hope, had to point to something that we were building to, that maybe this could get better. Maybe God is up to something, even in the midst of our own brokenness and our own fall. Hear these words beginning in verse 23. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed how these people say? The two families that the Lord chose have been rejected by him. And how they hold my people in such contempt that they no longer regard them as a nation. Have you heard... We're going to pause there for a second. Have you heard people like this? Now, now what Jeremiah is pointing out is I I would call these people the, the cynics. And I say this as a recovering cynic myself. Oh my gosh, it feels good to be a cynic, doesn't it? When you're so certain that nothing's ever going to get better. Why even work? Who cares? Everything's terrible. Oh, it feels good. It feels good to write off and be apathetic. Oh, it feels great. I can get back to my Black Friday shopping. So good. Have you heard people? Have you heard voices? Can you sense them in your own life today that look around and say, this isn't getting better. It's just doom and gloom. Be scared. Be afraid. Be in despair. Can you identify those voices in your life? But Jeremiah says, thus says the Lord, only if I had not established my covenant with day and night and the ordinances of heaven and earth would I reject the offspring of Jacob and of my servant David and not choose any of his descendants as rulers over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy upon them. What is Jeremiah talking about, you ask? I understand. That's a little bit of a dense text that I just read. Jeremiah's response to the cynics and the, and the despair that can be so overwhelming as we wait is to point to two things. The first is to the heavens. Jeremiah is speaking on God's behalf and says, don't you see the covenant I established with the sun and the moon and the stars, these celestial bodies that govern the cosmos? And even more is my love for you. And then he points him also to the ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. When hope feels lost, Jeremiah says, where should we look? The sun and the stars and the moon, these points of light that light the day and shine brightly, even the darkest of nights. Have you ever been in a really dark place where the stars just opened up? I remember going to the Grand Canyon and looking up and going, that's what the night sky looks like. That's what the ancestors saw. The seasons that change, that come and go without asking the king of Judah or Babylon if it aligns with their desires. The leaves that fall like empires and the fields that bloom as God's people learn new ways to love. This cosmic, seasonal, celestial language is common throughout the prophetic texts. Whenever the prophets are looking for a way to point to hope, they frequently point to the stars. Amos points to the Pleiades and to Orion. Why? Because maybe when we look up at these things, maybe when we look at the night sky and we see the stars dancing, we can remember that this world is bigger than us and the story is bigger than this day. And we can remember that it's not just our eyes that see these stars, but the eyes of our ancestors who have weathered so much more. The same ancestors who survived whatever uh, 
whatever problems or trials or sufferings they were wading through, and somehow led to us. We can see those stars with eyes similar to our ancestors. Heschel, Rabbi Abraham Heschel says, we can never sneer at the stars or mock the dawn or scoff at the totality of being. There's something about stepping out of ourselves and looking at the sky and remembering that our story and our life and our world is so much more that can grant us that hope that's not bound to a day or to an event or to an outcome. As a prophet, Jeremiah exudes this kind of unending hope. He doesn't say your exile is going to end on Tuesday. He doesn't say I'm getting out of prison tomorrow. But what he does say is look at the stars and tell me that God's not still here. The prophetic heart is filled with unending hope. And I pray that as the people of AUMC, we can not just be patient, but we can be patient prophets who know how to wait, and not just wait, but to wait with the hope, and not just a hope for ourselves, but a hope for us all. In our waiting, we are called to be the people of hope in the image of Jeremiah, called to join in God's unexpected redemptive work. How is God moving for you and your people this Advent? We are called to move from despair to patience. How can God's hope speak life into the waiting? And we are called to profess an unending hope. Be the kind of people who can look up at the night sky and see with the eyes of ancestors to know that the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac and the God of Rachel and the God of Mary and the God of Jesus is the God who still watches over you. Amen.